Our text this morning is Acts 2, verses 41 through 47. These are the words of God. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily in, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are thankful for the work that you've done here in Moscow and that we get to continue in that train. We, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that your spirit would work in us mightily, that you would apply it to our hearts, that you would build us up, you would do the miracle of preaching, that you would speak through me as the preacher and give us open ears as a congregation to hear what the spirit says to the churches. We ask that you do all this by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as we embark on a new work here in Moscow, we must begin by getting our thinking in line as to how God builds. Uh, So over the next couple weeks, Ben Merkel and I will be uh, cycling through a couple sermons looking at, through Scripture, how God builds his people, how God builds his church. And in fact, if we look at history, history really is the story of how God built his house. He didn't necessarily do a cost-benefit analysis He built it despite all the conniving of hell and earth. God set out by the the purposes of his his desires to to create the world and and to tell this story for the praise of his glory. And he built this house and he erected it despite all the conniving of earth and hell, all the uh, opposition of wicked men. He built it without outside investors. He built it at the cost of his only begotten son. And as we shall see as we look at this text, he's filled his house with fire. And so as we look at the text, we'll work through it here. As the miraculous day of Pentecost concluded, the shockwaves were only just beginning. So at the end of Peter's sermon, which is where our text picks up, uh, a multitude, 3,000 to be precise, gladly received the, the, the word that uh, Peter had proclaimed on the day of Pentecost, gladly received his word and were baptized there in verse 41. And this number 3,000 is a callback to the first Pentecost, uh, which, which the Jews celebrated uh, as the giving of the law, the, the, when Moses came down and, and brought the, the law down from Sinai. But on that day, uh, there were 3,000 Israelite idolaters who were cut down after the golden calf debacle. And so Pentecost was a celebration in Jewish, uh, in Jewish history of the giving of the law. But there's this interesting mirroring that's going on here that is, is brought up. That as 3,000 are added to the, the congregation of the people of God, it's a callback to the 3,000 idolaters who were cut down after the giving of the law at the very first Pentecost. The early church here is then described in its corporate worship. And here's how they're described. They're described as being steadfast, continual, uh, eager and earnest, uh, habitual even, in in the apostles' teaching. I don't want to lay stress upon the fact that they're they're steadfast in hearing the doctrine and the teaching of the, the apostles. And this, then, was the basis for their fellowship there in verse 42. So they're steadfast in the apostles' teaching. This forms the basis for their fellowship. It's not just a a cute club that they got together and decided to hang out. This was flowing out of the apostolic gospel, the, the, the teaching of the apostles. And they were steadfast as well in breaking the bread. In the Greek, uh, the bread in verse 32 is, takes the definite article. So it's a, a, a breaking of the bread and in prayers. And so you have this bracketing of teaching, bread, break, bread breaking, and prayers. This is uh, the, the church was earnest and eager in their uh, daily, uh, daily in the temple uh, in, in worship of the Most High God, steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. And the remarkable signs and wonders continued of the apostles' 
uh, great fear came upon all the people. There were many wonders and signs done by the apostles. And this was fulfilling the word, which uh, we read earlier from uh, the prophet Joel. So if you uh, flip over to the prophet Joel, Joel 2, 29, says this, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And so this, these, these signs and wonders that have been prophesied by Joel were being fulfilled in the midst of Israel in this in these early days of the church, and great awe came upon every soul, there in verse 43. Consequently, we see here the budding of Christian worship that continues to flower throughout the New Testament arc and down to the present day. So as we look later in Acts, it says that they're gathering daily to break the bread, to break bread together. Presumably, this is an instance of the Lord's Supper being taken, but we see that uh, by later on in the book of Acts, they're taking it weekly, on the first day of the week. And so there was an earnestness, there was an eagerness to sit under the apostles' teaching, to take the Lord's Supper, to to break the bread of the body of Christ together, and in prayers together, daily in the temple. And this describes their corporate worship, their formal worship, as it were, there in the temple daily in the early days of the church. So their corporate worship daily in the temple then spilled over into the rest of life. The believers were marked by generosity without compulsion. They freely sold what they had to give to those in need. And I want to highlight there that many people will point to this and say, aha, there's communism. There you have it. There's uh, the the, the hammer and sickle right there in in plain text. What you'll note, though, is that there's a free, uh, there's without compulsion, the believers were selling what they had to care for the fact that there were thousands of people that had come to sojourn in Jerusalem for these uh, Jewish feasts, the Passover for, uh, 50 days before, and then stuck around for Pentecost, likely. And so you have this great multitude who are sort of, uh, the, the hotels are full, and there's great need, there's, there's uh, and as we see throughout the rest of the book of Acts, there's daily added to their number many saints. Their numbers are growing. They're having trouble finding where do we put all these people. And so what marked the early church was a free generosity, a generosity without compulsion, which manifested itself in a particular care for the host of sojourners in Jerusalem, verse 44 through 45. Not only did they gather daily in the temple, but also we see them meeting house to house. The fellowship which they enjoyed through the apostles' doctrine spilled over into a joyful singularity of heart. And the, and the phrase there indicates a, there's no obstruction. It's wide open territory. There's no stumbling blocks in the way. There's no uh, rivalry and strife. It's uh, a, a clear plane for them to enjoy together. A singularity of heart is what defined them. And faithful praise to God. There in verse 46. The fruit of their faithful diligence in both formal and informal worship and fellowship was is interesting. It's favor amongst the people. That as the early church was diligent to uh, faithfully worship together daily in the temple, and then as they allowed the teaching of the apostles to shape their lives, to flow over into their daily life, their their house-to-house fellowship, what was notable was that they had favor amongst the people. And this, in turn, produced rapid growth, sort of un- an unrivaled uh, growth. Uh, the the 3,000 that were added at the day of Pentecost, but we also, if we skip forward a chapter or two, we have in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 14, and the believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. And then uh, skipping another chapter forward into chapter 6, verse 7, a striking, uh, a worthwhile footnote here. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. This is a mighty revival that's taking place as God is ushering in a great multitude into his house that he is building. The day of Pentecost, so a couple observations as we we look at this text and then uh, seek to apply it to our lives. The day of Pentecost is unmistakably mirroring something. It's mirroring the ancient events which took place at the Tower of Babel. 
Babel, after all, was man's attempt to climb into heaven, heaven to obtain a name for himself. Whereas God had tasked Adam and Eve to fill the world with his image, to multiply and fill the earth with humans who bear the image of God. And thus, in so doing, as they were to multiply and fill the world, they were to to bring God's glory and name into all corners of the world. That was God's task given to Adam and Eve. But the project of Babel was a rebellion to that. The, The project of Babel was to find a unifying principle for the universe in man apart from God. It was, instead of solo deo gloria, their motto was solo hominum gloria, to to man alone be the glory. So what did God do? What did God do to this uh, enterprise to let's find a way to get along apart from God himself? Let's see if we can build something for our name and for our glory instead of acknowledging God as sovereign and as king and as maker and creator of this world. What did God do? God came down and scattered them, confounded their language, confounded them their tongues. God scattered this blasphemous work. He confounded their language. And that's what's striking then in the book of Acts when the, when the Spirit of God comes down and they're speaking in tongues to each man in, in Jerusalem from all these different nations, hearing the disciples uh, proclaiming the gospel in their own tongues is this mirroring, this, this foil, if you will, of the Tower of Babel. God confounded the languages at Babel, fulfilling the worst fears of the builders of that tower. They had said, let's let's gather together and build a a tower for our name, lest we be scattered across the face of the earth. And exactly what they feared most was what God caught them with, is what God brought upon them, is what God brought down upon their heads. They were scattered across the face of the earth. The the kingdom of man, the city of man, was dashed to pieces and scattered across the world. This imagery of scattering is picked up later in the warnings to Israel. When the Lord threatens Israel uh, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, as he's warning them against breaking the covenant, against uh, disobeying the, the, the good blessings and the promises that God had given them, the Lord threatens them with this, with being scattered due to covenant breaking. There in Deuteronomy 4.27, we read, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be few, you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. But not only that, Israel was also to be God's means of scattering the city of man, of frustrating the purposes of those, uh, those men who would try to build miniature towers of Babel where they were scattered to. Uh, God uses Israel as his sword of justice to scatter and frustrate the purposes of those who would try to rebuild the Tower of Babel. And we see that in the battle hymn of Numbers uh, 10, 35. And it came to pass when the ark set forward as the Israelites were sojourning in the wilderness and proceeding to the promised land that when they when they'd set forward to march, uh, Moses would, would uh, lead the people in this call and response song and Moses would say, rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. It's the same word. And let them that hate thee flee before thee. And so as Israel was sent into the world, was sent forth to scatter these wicked nations, to to crush the towers, the miniature towers of Babel that were being erected in the land, this was the song which they would sing. Rise, Lord, let thine enemies be scattered. You see, when man sets out to build apart from God, and as we set out to build this work here, we must keep this in mind, that, that when, when man sets out to build apart from God and apart from God's purposes, or in rivalry to God, building a tower to his own name, his own renown, his own glory, God will scatter him. It's what God does. You might think, well, doesn't God love people doing creative things like building towers? not if it's done to the praise of man alone. The Hebrew word used for scatter here means dashing a vessel into a a million shattered pieces. It's sort of an irreparable harm done to the vessel. It's shattered and, and cast into a million pieces. And the Old Testament shows us God building by scattering the vain ambition of man. When man sets himself in rivalry to God, the end result isn't unity as they imagine. 
And, and we see this in, in sort of the ecumenical movements or in the sort of uh, political slogans that get thrown to us of we need to come across the aisle or we need to work together to solve this or that problem. We need to find some, some cohesive uh, point of unity that we can all sort of agree upon. And notice that almost, almost always it's in, in rebellion to or uh, refusing to acknowledge God as the supreme maker and Lord of the earth. And so when man tries to find a point of unity in himself, in, in our just getting together, in our singing kumbaya together around the fire, uh, th- we don't get unity. What we get is all the unity of a tornado in a trailer park. You don't get uh, uh, this beautiful tower. What you get is scattering. You get shrapnel. You get it scattered to the four winds of the world. And so if Israel this household that God was building, if they abandoned God and sought to build the kingdom apart from their covenant king, the result would be what we find in the early parts of the book of Acts, an Israel scattered to the four winds. It's it's at the beginning of of chapter 2 here in in Acts, you have this... uh, Luke basically draws a compass, a counterclockwise compass, and and goes through all the known lands with Jerusalem sort of as the focal point, the hub of uh, of all these nations. And the nations which are represented there at Pentecost echoes the table of nations which are listed in Genesis 10. So after Noah and his sons got off the ark, you have this chapter, one of those chapters of chronologies that we oftentimes just sort of glaze over and and ignore. What's, What's being set up there in Genesis 10 is here's these 70 nations from which all the nations of the earth would come. And immediately they go and they try to build this tower to their own glory. Well, here we have... The, uh, uh, the same, uh, the, the compass being drawn, the map being drawn, highlighting these 70 nations being gathered together here in Jerusalem. These 70 nations who had once been scattered and frustrated in their opposition to God's redemptive purposes have been gathered by God's providence in Jerusalem. And now this great sign, this great promise that had been prophesied by Joel takes place. And the, 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 the languages which had once been confounded are now, they're now hearing in their own languages this glorious gospel that this Messiah who had been promised has now come, has now filled his people uh, as the temple of old had been filled. How, how can this be? Now, however these scattered nations, uh, they, they, they represented uh, the, the Jews from the diaspora, they're gathered together as one by the mighty work of the Spirit. And suddenly you have this this compass being drawn together, all the four winds being gathered together, not by the project of let's build a tower to our own glory, but let's uh, let's be uh, filled now, let's be stones laid in the temple of the living God. Peter warns the crowd in his his, uh, sermon, he warns the Pentecost crowd to flee from this wicked generation, Acts 2 verse 40. He tells them there, and with many other words did Peter testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation, from this wicked generation. Well, who's he referring to there? He's referring to this unbelieving Israel, the, 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 the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the, the scribes and the Pharisees who had set themselves to uh, crucify the Christ and, and, and the, the powers of, of uh, the wicked kingdoms of of Pilate and Herod, who had set themselves uh, in opposition to this Savior. Paul's, uh, Peter's referring to this wicked generation, this unbelieving Israel, which itself had now become a new Babel of sorts. The Lord, Jehovah, who had descended as a flaming fire upon Israel's altars, dwelt in her tabernacle and temple, now sent his spirit to dwell in a house of people, but a people from all nations, from the 70 nations. And so what marked these early Christians as a result of the Spirit's working? Notice what characteristics are attributed to them. One, fidelity to the gospel as taught by the apostles, fellowship together on the basis of that gospel breaking the bread together, faithfulness in partaking of the Lord's Supper together. 
prayers, both spoken and sung, and then hospitality, glad simplicity, and praise to God. Faithfulness and worship, both public and private. Hosp- fellowship together in the, in the house of God, in the temple of God, as a living temple of God. And then also uh, worship in our individual homes, hospitality, giving of our own uh, resources and, and property to care for the needs of those around us. Throwing an extra carrot in the crock pot to invite somebody over after church. There are faithfulness in, in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread, hospitality, glad simplicity, and praise to God. And this description given to us here of the early church was and is the secret sauce to church growth. Modern Christians think that they can build the kingdom of God by using the bricks of Babel. We see it in the way evangelical leaders capitulate to the talking points of godless politicians. You'll see some event take place in the news, and immediately you'll see certain evangelical leaders capitulate and just take a page out of the playbook of uh, men who, politicians and, and media personalities who hate God, and you'll see evangelical leaders just taking a page out of their talking points to advance, you know, here's what we need to do, in hopes that they can cozy up and, and draw people in to the church using the talking points of godless politicians or media personalities. We we see this as well in in the way worship services in the modern church oftentimes are turned into entertainment events, thinking that if we somehow make it pop and sizzle, that people will will come in droves, as if if we could somehow compete with the pyrotechnics of of, uh, uh, of the rock stars and and pop stars and and, and the, the... the wow factor of of the latest blockbuster film. We we see this capitulation in in how the plain word of the gospel is dulled and blunted in order uh, for the church to sort of nuzzle into the same space as Oprah and Dr. Phil and the self-care counselors on TikTok. I saw recently uh, a worship band that released an album uh, of, of songs for, create, uh, for care of the creation and environmental justice, drawing from the pages, again, of, of talking points of men that deny God and, and revile God. We see this also in, in the way the plain command of Scripture to, to show hospitality. Cons- we end up considering an inconvenience to our personal schedule and possessions. But what we have here in the text before us is the description, the the secret sauce for how God builds his church. This is the description of not just the early church, but the church of God throughout all ages. And when the church is obedient and faithful to the apostles' doctrine, to the gospel of our Lord Jesus, faithful to gather together, to lift our prayers, to partake of the supper together, to spill out over into hospitality and praise to God. What God pleases to do is grant favor amongst all the people, to see that in them dwells the living God. So while modern Christians oftentimes want to try to wow and scintillize using the tools of Babel, the bricks of Babel, building God's kingdom using Babel's bricks, God gathers people into his house by the faithful preaching of the scandal of the gospel. The house of Israel crucified Jesus, the promised Messiah, the rejected cornerstone, but yet God was not thwarted in his purpose. You might think, well, that was the whole point, right? To bring the Messiah and they kill him. And we know that what God was accomplishing was the salvation, was the erecting of a kingdom that would have no end. God was not thwarted in his purpose by the killing of the Messiah. Rather, that same Jesus, as we, as we read in, in Peter's sermon, that same Jesus was now exalted to be the true and eternal king of Israel. And his first act was to accompany the preaching of his kingdom with the power of the Spirit, to enable his citizens to joyfully obey their king. So the Spirit was poured out, like like the flame of, of God's presence had come down upon the altars of Israel in days of old, whether it be Elijah's altar or the, the altar in the tabernacle, 
or as God's presence dwelt in the, in the holy of holies of the tabernacle in the temple, this flame of fire would come down and rest upon the altars in the tabernacle. But now, in the book of Acts, in this day of Pentecost, we have the Spirit being poured out, and the people didn't just sit around and, 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 and hand out lays and, and sing quaint songs around the fire. It wasn't just a twiddle your thumbs and let's, let's all be kind of peace, love, harmony, man. What we note is the people's uh, busyness. The, the people of God, these, these saints who are filled with the Spirit, get to work. They weren't idle. The first Pentecost, as I mentioned earlier, at Sinai was, was the giving of the law. And it was followed by God's direction for the construction of the tabernacle. And so uh, the, uh, the, the law was given, and what's striking is that uh, Moses was given the, the pattern of the mount, the, the pattern he was shown in the mount to bring down to the people, to instruct them as to how to build the tabernacle. And there's a striking phrase uh, in Exodus 31, uh, verse 3. There's a striking phrase as to uh, uh, God sets apart two men for this work. And the language there ought to remind us of what God is doing here in the book of Acts. And I have filled him, uh, Bezalel, the son of Uri, with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahishamak, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. And so at the first Pentecost, the instructions also came down, and it, the Spirit of God filled these men, Bezalel and Aholiab, with cunning and artifice to be able to build this tabernacle that God had instructed Israel to build. And now, as the Spirit is poured out upon this uh, um, this uh, gathering of, of, of Jews from all the nations, God is now filling them with his spirit, with this spirit of prophecy, with this spirit of power in order to do and obey the commands that God has given them. And so just as the spirit had equipped the ancient saints with skill to build the tabernacle, the spirit now fills his people to build a temple of people, people in whom God pleases to dwell. The Spirit's outpouring became what we see here described in our text. It became a flood, not just of idleness. It wasn't, it wasn't a sitting around uh, being bored. It wasn't a, uh, just a, a gathering of, of hippies. The Spirit's outpouring became a flood of what? Good works. They were busy fellowshipping. They were busy in prayers and praise. They were busy in covenant faithfulness, being devoted to the teaching of the apostles. They were consistent in hospitality and caring for the needs of this gathered multitude who was sojourning in Jerusalem. And they were eager in simplicity of heart. And so, drilling down and, and, and looking at how do we apply this to our lives, what is the work that God has set in front of you to do? What is the work that God has set for us to do? Notice that the progression in our text makes one thing plain. The apostles' doctrine was inseparable from the practice of the saints. As they devoted themselves to the teaching of the word, the word shaped the practice of the people. The word went forth in power, and the people lived out the word. The works of righteousness followed the word of the righteous one. And in many regards, nothing in principle has been altered since that day of Pentecost, since that first day of Pentecost. The description of the early church is what the true church is and always shall be defined by. And so as we look at this new work that God has begun here in Moscow, as God has blessed the ministries and the churches here in Moscow that were filling up and running out of space right from the get-go, what is it that God would have us be devoted to? What is the work that God has set for us to do? The first work is to be devoted to the apostles' doctrine. The first work is to be devoted to worshiping the Lord in the congregation of saints. And from that then flows our ability to fellowship together, 
to enjoy hospitality together. This description of the early church is what the true church is and always shall be defined by. Pentecost displays in vivid detail how God builds. God builds by scattering the proud and their vain imaginations. And then, just because he can, just because he loves to do things that confound the wisdom of the wise, he gathers up the humble as a house of people. And God then filled that house with the fire of his presence. The Spirit's fire equips the saints with his presence. God dwells in his people, both corporately and individually. God dwells in you by his Spirit. He equips you for the tasks, for the good works he's prepared in advance for you to do. God equips you by coming and dwelling in you. Thus, we're enabled to minister in his house. We're enabled to serve him in his house. God's household, then, isn't a silent, empty cathedral where you must not raise your voice above a whisper. God's house, this house of people that God is building, it's full of the bustle and hum of jovial saints busy with sacred work. And what is that work? Our first duty is to believe the apostles' teaching. It's what Peter says here in this in his famous sermon, God has made Jesus, whom the house of Israel crucified, the house of Israel who ought to, been, who ought to have received their Messiah with joy, but had become a tower of Babel instead. God has made that Jesus, whom the house of Israel crucified, he hath made him both Lord and Christ. He has made him king of the world. He has made him king of his people. So our first duty is to believe what the apostles taught us, that there is no name given other than the name of Jesus by which we must be saved. There is no name that we must raise other than the name of Jesus. But also, our second duty is to faithfully worship our Christ, to faithfully worship this, this Jesus who has been made both Lord and Christ over the, the true house of Israel. So we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, we then respond in faithful worship. And third, we throw the best parties. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that by your spirit, you fill us up to do good works. And you send us out to bring your grace and your mercy, your peace to this city, to our nation, to this generation. We thank you that by your spirit, you fill us up, you equip us, that we might go forth in boldness to proclaim and herald in our various duties, our various professions, the grace, the goodness, the power of your spirit. We pray that you would take these words and apply them to our heart. Build us up in the most holy faith. We offer it now and as we offer back to you the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Paul's instructions regarding how the saints are to take this meal include the familiar phrase teaching us how to discern the Lord's body. This instruction has unfortunately been uh, too often taken as a permission slip to invite the black hole of introspection into our hearts. But introspection is no savior. When we collectively give way to an unhealthy self-examination, we're blinded to seeing what Paul explicitly commands us to see. If we're doing this right, Paul's instruction actually means that we should be looking through these signs and beholding Christ here in these plain elements. Christ's body broken and his blood spilled proves that God's wrath for your sin has been satisfied. All that remains to you is God's favor. So get over yourself. Stop staring inward and look up. And as you look heavenward to the Father's right hand, you see grace descending from Christ our head to fill the entirety of his body, the church. And thus, we're brought to look around here is Christ's body in the midst of these gathered saints. The border of that body isn't confined to this building alone or this or that group alone. Christ's body is comprised of all the faithful saints here and there, past and future, young and old. Discerning Christ's body isn't an invite to stare at ourselves in Narcissus' pool. Looking away from self and to Christ enables you to rightly discern those who are born of God. 
Indeed, John also makes this point. He says, if you know that he is righteous, Christ is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. As we feast on the word, we're drawn together with those begotten by the word. All because we've heard and believed the living word. Therefore, look to Christ here on this table. Look up to Christ enthroned. Look to Christ in his body which surrounds you. And come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this body broken, for this blood spilled that assures us of our union with you through Christ and by Christ, our union and fellowship with each other. We thank you that you give us these signs to build up our faith, to encourage our faith, to nurture it. And we give thanks now in Jesus' name. And amen. First reminder, and then, then the charge, the reminder is there's treats and refreshments downstairs, so make sure to linger for that. Love to get to break in this new building by having some hearty fellowship together afterwards. The charge is this. The Spirit isn't a, an emotional force. Oftentimes, the Spirit of God is portrayed as just this warm, fuzzy feeling that we get when we sing a nice, uh, the, the third verse of Be Thou My Vision. The Spirit isn't an emotional force a force of emotional potency, as it were. The Spirit is the presence of the living God. And, it, and He gives us force uh, to do good works. He gives us strength to do good works. And so the question before you is, what work has God put in my hand to do? The charge is this, what is the work that God has given you? The first work is here, fellowshipping together, hearing God's Word, partaking of God's Word in the supper. And then we turn around and we say, okay, God, what have you given me to do this week? What diapers do I need to change what spreadsheets do I need to make sure balance? What, what website do I need to dev- uh, design? And we do it all by the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. So hear now with believing hearts and open hands the benediction of your Father. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. And amen.